to Romans chapter 3. So Romans 3, hold your place there. Romans 9, verse 2 and verse 33. I'll give you time to find your place in Job 9, verse 2, and then in verse 33. Job 9 2 says, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? How should a man be just or right or righteous or we could even say the word holy before God? I'll turn to Job 9.33. Job said, Neither is there any daysman betwixt us, speaking of God and man, that he may lay his hand on us both. Job has asked the most important question that all humanity must ask and then answer. How is it that a man is just with God? How is it that a man is right with God? Now, if you ask any religious person, and due to so many religions in the world today, you ask a man that represents this, this religion and that religion, and they all have their answer. But there's only one answer that is the right answer. If you ask the Mormon, how are they right with God? It's they live a good life, they follow the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith is their mediator. You ask a Catholic how are they right with God? Well, you go to church, you take the sacraments, you go to confession, you do your Hail Marys, you give penance, you give money to the collection, you try to live a good life, you, you, you do all the right things, you, 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 you do this and you do that, and then you go to the Muslim and they say, uh, this is how I'm right with God. I, 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 you know, I serve Allah. The, the Muslim serves a Savior, but he's no Savior at all. And they'll say, well, I, I give my life I sacrifice. I, I'll die for all of them. They say, that's how I know I'm going to heaven when I die and I'll get 40 virgins when I get there. But what does the Bible say? How is it that a man is right with the one true God? And that question you've got to ask and answer for yourself. And if you answer the question in first person because I do this and I do that, it's because, and then you say, well, it's because I believe, I repented, I trusted. You failed to understand the gospel because Matthew 7 says, Not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. And in that day, many will say to me, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wondrous works? And Jesus said, I will say to them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. For I never knew you. If you were to die today and stand before the judgment, the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, if you were to stand before God today, what would you have to say to God on why He should let you in to heaven? And if you answer in the first person like they did in Matthew 7, you have no hope of getting into heaven this morning. But if you'll answer in the third person, 
because Jesus died for me. Was buried and rose again the third day for me. That He's ascended up and He has atoned my sin. And He's not left me to myself. He has prayed for me, provided for me, protected me, and matured me. And I can enter in because Christ has bought me, paid for me, and He has brought me here for this reason. And this reason alone is the only way I can enter into heaven. That's who's born again this morning. Not that I go to church. Not that I'm an independent Baptist. Not because I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Those are good things. But the Mormon will say the same things. I believe in the Bible. But if Jesus Christ and what He's accomplished is not enough for you to trust in, and if you try to add anything to the finished work of Christ, it is heresy and blasphemy. It's not that I trust Jesus and now I'm going to try to do better. You have failed to recognize the gospel. Amen. You have failed to recognize that Jesus is enough. How awful it would be to say, yes, I believe in Jesus, but I've got to do this, 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 and this in order to get to heaven. You know what you're telling God? God, you failed in saving me and that I've got to do something to contribute to what Christ has already bought and paid for. That's the difference between a religion and a true relationship with Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 3, if you would. I want you to look very carefully in verses 21 through 31 because the Bible answers the question that Job has asked on how should a man be just with God. Romans chapter 3 verse 21 But now the righteousness of God without the law, is manifested. How is that even possible? <laughs> because law keeping never made anybody righteous. Why? Because if you don't obey the law perfectly, you've broke the whole law. This is how serious this is. God is holy, God is righteous, and man is not. I can't make myself righteous. Last Lord's Day, you remember, we talked in Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will no wise enter in. But the Bible says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, from Genesis to the book of the Revelation, the canonical books, the 66 canonical books of the Bible has one theme, one message, and that's Jesus and His redemptive work for humanity. The Bible ain't about us doing better, living better, doing all. It's about Jesus because you can't live better. You can't do better. You ain't good. Christ is the only thing good. Amen. It's amazing how man has turned the Bible into a self-help book to make to appease their guilty conscience before God like you're earning the favor of God. If you're working yourself to death, you're miserable, you, you can't seem to get ahead, you can't seem to do enough, it's because you failed to come to the cross and recognize all that was involved at Calvary. Look at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God which is, how do you get it? By faith. By faith of Jesus Christ, he says. 
So you must have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen as yet. Hebrews 11, 1. Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So let's get something clear. You are righteous in the eyes of God, not by what you do or what you say. It is by faith. Faith is trusting, committing, oneself to believing <laughs> abandoning myself in what and who Jesus is for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest any man should Free, available, and able to save. This begs the question that I've am I trusting in myself or am I trusting in Christ? Am I trusting in my denomination or am I trusting in Christ? Am I trusting in My preacher to get me to heaven or am I trusting in Christ and Christ alone? Am I trusting in Christ and relying on myself to to prove to myself that I am saved? Because that is a thing and it's called idolatry. Oh God, help us this morning to see what the Scriptures literally says that the righteousness that we need to get to heaven is not of ourselves. It comes by faith in Jesus Christ. And then it says, Unto all and upon all them that believe. The fact that the word believe, it means to commit oneself to. It means to trust. It means to know. As Paul would say, I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Then he says, he says that for there is no difference. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. If you know anything about the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1 verse 18 to Romans 3 20, he's telling us about the wrath of God, that all men are under sin, whether they're Jew, whether they're Gentile, whether they're religious, or whether they're not religious. All are guilty before God. He says there's no difference. And then he reiterates it in verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now here's the the answer. Verse 24 through 31. But we'll look at 24 through 26. Being justified freely by His grace. Oh, listen. Justified freely by His grace. Freely by His grace. It literally could be rendered that we are justified by His gracious gift, which is Christ. Grace is unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. That God has set His affection toward us and because of Christ, He's able to legally, judicially declare us righteous in the court of heaven. To be justified is to stand before God just as if you had never sinned. The problem is is that we have used this term S A. B E D so much 
We don't even recognize what all is involved with. Saved. Saved is a Bible word and I'm thankful for it. But I'm afraid people don't know what they're saved from. And people don't know what they're saved to. And when we just start talking about biblical words that describe what S-A-V-E-D means, such as regeneration. That's being born again. Made anew. This is where your eyes are open, your ears are open. And as God did in the book of Acts 16 and verse 14 about Lydia, that God opened up the heart of Lydia. And she believed the gospel. Regeneration is this supernatural working of the Holy Ghost for the first time in your life you realize and you see and recognize what God sees about you. And you realize you're unable to save yourself. You can't do anything in and of yourself and that you are drawn and convicted of your sin and you're drawn to Christ and you cling to Christ. That's regeneration. Regeneration and ju justification happen simultaneously the moment one sees and recognizes they're drawn to Christ and that moment you believe. Uh, hey, hey, as Miss Lauren did last Sunday morning, that moment she came and she committed her life to Christ and said, I want to live for Jesus. I want to be forgiven of my sins. That very moment she believed in the court of heaven, not guilty is the verdict. Regeneration, justification. And then there's another term I would mention real quickly, sanctification. This is the lifelong process where God takes the legal status of your standing with God in the course of heaven and that for the work of sanctification is a lifelong process where God gets hell out of you and puts heaven in you. This is the process where He conforms us to the image of Jesus Christ. This is the process in which God makes you holy and His righteousness becomes a living reality. When you get to heaven, you won't be foreign of it. You'll know something about the righteousness of Christ because He's worked it in you since the day He came. Amen. Amen. And then there's another term, glorification. The Bible says exclusively who the Lord justifies, He sanctifies. This idea, I believe in Jesus and I don't get changed, that's a lie. <laughs> if you're not becoming more like Jesus, let me tell you, if you don't struggle more now with sin than the moment you first believe, I really doubt you got in. Every day I live, the more aware of how unable I am to do better. And the, war, the lie of religion is you just need to do better. You just need to have more faith. Huh? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Do, do this and do that. No, you need to run to Jesus. And realize and recognize it's not about me. It's not about my performance. It's about what Jesus has already done and what He's declared before the Father as our daysman, as our advocate, as our mediator with God the Father. God hasn't left us to ourselves. He's given us the Holy Ghost and He and Jesus Himself is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us this morning. Then there's this word that we'll find. Redemption. Propitiation. Brother Paul Washer says, if any preacher ever surrenders to missions, the very first question that he asks him is, can you tell me the doctrine of propitiation? If you can't tell me what propitiation is, you need to go sit down and sit under your pastor a little bit longer and learn what propitiation is because you're not yet ready to enter the mission field. Wow. How so quick were evil? Well, I believe God called me to preach and then we let them go. 
Let's talk about the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. This is what makes you Christian, sir, ma'am. How do you view the propitiating work of Christ? What did that blood accomplish when it was shed on that cross? And how does it make you in a right standing with God? So let me just tell you real quickly. We'll read verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And now He takes us beyond the veil and lets us look at the old economy. This is why the Old Testament saints were in Abraham's bosom in paradise until Christ died and was buried and raised again the third day because their sins had yet to be propitiated. And now that they've been propitiated, they're allowed to enter into heaven. Amen. Amen. So there's more too. Are you washing the blood than just a song? It's a reality. Unless you've been to the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath that flood and lose all their guilty stains. Son, you need to run to Calvary. You need to run to Christ this morning. You need to be washed in the blood of the righteous Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. (coughs) He's the propitiation. He says, verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Now I'm going to stop my reading there because I don't have time to deal with verses 27 through 31 in chapter 4. We'll look at that maybe next Lord's Day, but we need to really hone in on how can a man be right with God. God tells us in this passage. If you know anything about the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3 verses 9 through 20, it speaks to us of our need of being justified. Our need for salvation. It speaks of our need for Christ. You go back and it tells us in verse number 9, whether you are Gentile, we're all under sin. We're all in bondage to sin. Every last one of us. Everybody that's ever lived on this earth other than Jesus has been under sin. And he tells us in verse 10, none righteous. No, not one. That means you don't have enough. You can't do enough. You can't produce any kind of righteousness in and of yourself that can save you. Let me just go ahead and tell you right now. Salvation is divine accomplishment, not human achievement. Salvation is of the Lord, and you're saved not because of what you've done, you're saved because of what Jesus has done. And I understand that there is some responsibility to every sinner to come to repent and believe. But buddy, if it had not been for Jesus dying for you, had it not been for the Holy Ghost calling you out of that sin, there would never be any kind of faith, any kind of repentance, whatsoever. Right? You take Him out of the equation, you don't come. You don't repent. You take the Holy Ghost out of the equation. You take God the Father out of the equation. There's no hope for nobody. But thanks be to God, that's not the case. Amen. There is hope and there is help, but it's going to require you to humble yourself and admit you can't. I will say this about salvation. Salvation ain't a makeover. It's a takeover. God didn't come to paint up the outside. He come to change you inside out. He come to take over your life because you you you've been allowed to run your life. And look at what you've produced. A big old zero. But now that Christ has taken over, you are perfectly righteous in the eyes of God. Salvation 
Salvation also is not a reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. Yes. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Those that are well need not a physician. I come to those folks and know they're not well. The fact is, in the religious world, you can't find anybody that's not well anymore or will openly admit things aren't good. I'm okay. You know, don't worry about me. Everybody's going through it. It's no big deal. I'm okay. Are you really? If you have lied to yourself so long, you believe the lie. May God waken you out of that stupor this morning. Amen. This idea of getting your life in order then coming to Jesus is a lie straight from the pit. Nobody can get their life together Amen. apart from Jesus Christ. Amen. You may turn over a new leaf for a while, but unless Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life, you're going to be like a dog going back to its own vomit. Amen. So let's look at this passage. Verse 21 Down through 26, if the Lord will help us. I've elaborated so far in verse 21 through 23, but I want us to emphasize verse 24, 25, and 26 with the time we have left. And real quickly, there's three things I want to show you. Number one, the source of our justification is found in verse 24. Justify freely by His what? Grace. That is the source, that is the means in which you're justified is that God is a gracious God and He doesn't give you what you deserve. We live in a society of spoiled brats that don't think anything ought to ever be bad happen to them. And then to question what God is doing is a very evidence that they are spoiled and they think they deserve better than what they're getting. Let me tell you something. If everybody in this room, including myself, I would be first in line, by the way. If I got what I deserved, I would have been in hell a long time ago. Yeah. So would you. Yeah. Oh, what a gracious God. That would withhold His wrath upon us. The Gospel in Romans 1.18 starts with the wrath of God. The wrath of God is revealed against heaven against all what? Ungodliness and unrighteousness. Amen. Everything we are, the wrath of God is revealed. But thanks be to God, His grace restrains that wrath so He doesn't wipe us out the very moment we see it. So if you say, well, I want justice. Okay, God takes His grace and you get thrown in hell. Is that what you want? Oh no, nobody wants that. Yeah. Come on, Grace. Why do you think Jesus hasn't come back yet? He's long suffering. He's patient. And on the last one. Whew, the last member of the bride comes in. There's gonna be wedding. Jesus will come and take us to our new home and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. That's good news for us. The source of our justification is God not giving us what we do not deserve. It's God being gracious The supply, the, the, the supply of this justification is found in verse 25. Uh, it uses the word redemption and propitiation. We, we need to identify and recognize those things. And, and third and finally, we, we, we see the substance of our justification. It, it's found in verse 28 that a man is justified by faith without what? The deeds of the law. How about that? Whew. 
So it's not dependent on me. It's me just recognizing I can't make it without Jesus. You can't make it without Him. Jesus said, I'm the true vine, you're the branches. Without me, you can do Even the people that repent, that will refuse to repent, refuses to believe, God is still gracious and long-suffering with them and that He allows them to do whatever they do. The very one that shakes the fist at God is still the same God that gives them breath in their lungs. He could be just in striking them dead, but He don't. Oh, wow. So let, let's talk about justification. In verse 24... It says, being justified, declared righteous, to be innocent, to be blameless, to be declared in a legal standing in the court of law as exonerated of all charges. Is that what justification means? And we're justified how? Freely by His grace. The two bookends of how God deals with sin is found in Romans 1, 16 and 17 and Romans 3, 21 and 22. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17 says that herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Then verse 18 says that the wrath of God is revealed against against heaven, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Then you come to Romans chapter number 3 verse 21 and after he gives this long spill that all are sinned and all are guilty, none righteous, no not one. You come to verse 21 and it starts with but. Thank God for this conjunction. Thank God that God intervened. That God took the initiative. Thank God, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. How can God say that? Because, listen, the law never could save us. It's how's it manifested through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to know the the substitute, the Savior, is Jesus and Jesus alone. And it says, through the redemption. We need to understand what redemption is. The, the, The word redemption. What does it mean? To purchase. To to reconcile. When you think about redemption, the Old Testament alludes to God redeeming Israel out of Egyptian bondage and out of Babylonian captivity, and bringing them into their own land. Does anybody remember how God brought Israel out of Egypt? The blood on the doorpost, on the top, both sides. And another vivid way of seeing what redemption is, It's through the life of a prophet by the name, man named Hosea. God told Hosea, I want you to go marry this prostitute whose name is Gomer. God, are you sure about that? Yep. So Hosea goes and marries. Gomer hangs around for a little while. But it isn't long that Gomer goes back to her prostitution and her old way of living. Hosea's tore up. He he really cares. He loves this woman. And she's given him every reason not for him to love her. Hosea says, Lord, what do you want me to do? He says, go to the town square, son. 
Today she's going to be auctioned off and I want you to buy her back. I want you to redeem her. I want you to pay the purchase price to buy her out of that life and prove your love for her. Now how like we all, like we have sheep have gone astray. The songwriter said it best, Oh Lord, how prone I am to wonder. How prone I am to leave the God of love. We never get it right, do we? We fail miserably every day. Just one look at Calvary proves that Jesus is a God. And that He loves His sinners. Do you feel that Jesus loves you? This I know for the Bible tells me so. Do you know that regardless of whatever happens in your life that Jesus loves you? That He died for you? Though you may backslide, though you may fail, though you're going to falter under life's heavy load, but aren't you glad there stands a Savior wounded and bleeding, poor sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for you and me? You understand what Jesus done for you and me? Because verse 26 of Romans 3 says He is just and the justifier. How can God forgive the wicked? How is it that God can forgive the ungodly? Because God had to satisfy the righteous demands of the law. How is it? Because God is holy and righteous. How is it that He can, that he can be gracious to forgive them without condoning their sin? The price had to be paid. The penalty of that sin had to be paid in God's courtroom. In order for you to be saved. Think about it. Though our sins are many, thank God His mercy is more. Think of every time we failed, every time we've sinned, and thank God knew we were going to do it before we ever done. Romans four five said He justifies the ungodly. Yeah. Romans 5, 6 says when we were without strength, <laughs> woo, Christ died for the ungodly. Right. Romans 5, 8 says but God committed His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So aren't you glad today that when you are messed up and still messed up today, when you didn't have it all together, when you were sinned by the anchor, when you're living your quote-unquote best life now, sowing your wild oats, God knew you were going to do it, yet He laid down His life for you. Though God knew you would fail it every day, He still loves you. And thank God He paid the price that we could be forgiven. Let this dawn on you. That for every sin you would ever commit, it was laid on Jesus. Amen. And He's paid for it. Now the liberals in this progressive Christian movement would say, Praise God, I can go live any kind of way I want to because He's already paid for it. They've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, as Jude says. They've turned the grace of God into a license to sin. If it ever dawns on you that, that I couldn't do this to get salvation, that Jesus had to literally take the punishment of my crime, that's going to cause you not to want to. So, if you struggle when you sin, praise God. The problem is when you sin and it no longer bothers you, you have something to worry about. 
We have a misconception of the holiness of God. God is holy, holy, holy. Amen. I'm thankful for this, that I've come to realize <coughs> in Exodus 3, when God revealed Himself to Moses in the burning bush, and God said, Moses, I want you to go redeem my people. Moses had been fleeing for his life because he killed an Egyptian. He spent 40 years on the backside of his father-in-law's wilderness raising sheep. And God reveals himself to him and he says, go deliver my people. And he says, who am I going to say send me? He says, you tell him I am that I am. Amen. Literally, I am who I am. If you think about that just for a minute, you have to take time and process what God is saying. Why didn't God say, I'm like this or I'm like that? Because there's nobody that compares That's to right. Amen. You want to know who I am? I'm just like the common man sitting on the pew this morning. I'm just like you. And you're just like me. When it comes to God, God says, there's none like me. Amen. And so when we think about the holiness of God, God has never been tainted. He's perfectly righteous. He's perfectly right to judge every one of us. And He is judging every one of us. And you will stand before Him one day. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. What will you say when you stand before God on that day? God's going to ask you the question that Job asked. How can you be right with me? Why should I let you into heaven? That's a question you need to get marked down today. Yeah. If in the fact that Jesus died for me, that Jesus redeemed me, that Jesus died in my place, He took my... Let me put it in a language we can understand. You, in one moment in time, were so enraged by something you seen. And you confronted that person and that person retaliated. And you took their life. And you went before the court of the law. And according to the law, You'll find in your Old Testament, if you take the life of another man, you are to die like you took that life. Whether you've done it out of rage, whether you were doing self-defense, if you killed somebody, your life was taken. That's what the law requires. Though you went through the court of the law, and the judge says you're guilty, the law demands us to take your life at such and such day, at such and such time, you will be executed. That is your sentence. Can I tell you that's every one of our sentences outside of Christ. This morning. Amen. But so what happens if somebody wants to take your place and says, I'll take that punishment. I'll die in their place. That's what Jesus did for you. That's what it is to be Peter says we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by the precious blood. There's this other word, propitiation. Propitiation. It is a real good word. It's a word that you and I need to get a hold of. Propitiation. Literally means to appease the wrath. To placate the one who is angry. In 2023, in our Western civilization, and even in America, God has been wrongly perceived in many pulpits. And the thing that has been said that God is love, and praise God, God is love. But He's also holy. Amen. 
And every one of God's attributes is revolved around God's holy, impeccable, immutable character. There has been an apostatizing of professing Christians to call this propitiation that God set forth in His Son Jesus to be the propitiation of our sins as John says, we have an advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Amen. We have a generation of people and preachers that will get up and preach a God that's never angry. My Bible still says God's angry at the wicked every day. My Bible says we serve a jealous God. My Bible says His wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Is it any wonder Isaiah and Isaiah 6 did what he did when God's glory filled the house? Y'all know what he did? Woe is me! I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. May I remind you, Isaiah is a prophet. The best thing about him is what he's saying. He's literally speaking the Word of God. And he says, that's the worst thing about me in God's presence. In our Western civilization and in our churches in America, we thank God's met with us if everybody's jumping and hollering and shouting and running the aisles, jumping into baptistries and everything else. Are you sure that's God and not just some emotion that's got you stirred up? Amen. People act like that at the ball game. Tear down ball posts. What happens when God shows up? Everybody gets on their face and weeps and mourns because they're in the presence of a sinless holy God. Amen. We've lost that awe and respect and reverence in our day. People just think God forgives and looks the other way. We're, this is why our country's in the shape she's in. This is why the church is in the shape she's in. This is why the home is in the shape she's in. We've lost sight of Jesus. Amen. We've got a people who are more worried about when the Antichrist is going to show up than Jesus coming again. We got too many people preaching the book of Revelation. They're not preaching about Jesus. They're preaching about Gog and Magog and Russia and the Antichrist and Putin and all this other nonsense and Donald Trump. May God give us some leather lung preachers that'll mount the pulpit again and preach the word of God. That'll lift up the blood stained banner and say Jesus saves. We need preachers that'll stand up and preach it straight and true again. We need a man who'll stand up and brag on Jesus and say Jesus He's your only hope. Amen. We play in church, not having church. Because we're not seeing Jesus. When you realize He propitiated, He appeased the wrath of God. We deserve that He satisfied the wrath and condemnation of God that was due us. That you could be free to be redeemed, to be bought out of that life into this new life and be a new creature in Christ. This is what Jesus did. <laughs> Why is propitiation necessary, you may ask? Because God's wrath rests upon all unrighteousness and ungodliness. Good church member that's never been born again, God's angry at you. What birthed America into existence was the preaching of George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards' famous message is that he was almost blind. He could only read his Bible with it this far from his face. And when he preached his message, he would write them out in manuscript and in a monotone voice, he would literally read from the script that he wrote down. And Jonathan Edwards' famous message was sinners in the hands of an angry God. Amen. Yeah. 
The progressive Christian movement has changed it into sinners in the hands of a living God. Just as if they would change the, the great hymn in Christ alone, there on the cross the wrath of God was satisfied. They want it changed there on the cross the love of God was magnified. You can't have love without justice. You can't have love without wrath. Until you see how awful you are, sir, ma'am, and what you really deserve, then do you understand the love of God. Here on that cross, Jesus became everything you and I were. And He absorbed the wrath of God. And if you have not Christ, you're going to spend an eternity in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone where there's weeping and gnashing of the teeth that is called the bottomless pit. Jesus said it's where the worm dieth not and the flames are never quenched. You know why it's a place of outer darkness? Because on that cross it went dark at noonday and for three hours it was black on the earth. Jesus was becoming sin on our behalf and God was judging Jesus as if we were the sin, if He were the sinner and worthy of hell. The price has been paid. Run to Christ. He is the hope and the only hope. What more has to be said for you to realize Jesus is our only hope. Not a new government. Not a new president. Not a new church. Not a new pastor. None of this. Not a new job. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Amen. Yes. By the way, you don't need another spouse. You need to pray for the one you got. You don't need another church to go to. You need to pray for the one you're at. Amen. Hey, hey Amen. Where else are we going to go? I'd be mild if I preached like this in most places. I don't do that to be arrogant or perceptive. I'm just telling you, people hate this. They don't like this because it tells us you're not good enough and you never can do nothing good enough to get to heaven. You are wholly dependent on God saving you. Thank God He came by. Your way. Thank God He placated the wrath of God when you deserve to die. When you ought to have been zapped in hell, Jesus. Oh, my soul. If it ever done on us what Jesus ever done for us, this world couldn't handle us and we'd turn this world upside down. Amen. My question, has this ever happened to you? Do you know you've been redeemed? And to be redeemed means you've been bought and that you belong to God. And to be propitiated is that God has taken the initiative and He's appeased the wrath of God. Let me read you this quote and we'll give the invitation. Charles Cranfield, a great theologian, has expressed it with care and elegance about God's propitiation and justifying work. God, because in His mercy, He willed to forgive sinful men. And being truly merciful, He willed to forgive them righteously. That is, without any way condoning their sin. Purpose to direct against His own very self and the person of His Son the full weight of that righteous wrath which they deserve. Now why am I going to heaven? Because Jesus. Why, do I, why am I not going to hell? Because of Jesus. Real life, what are you trusting in this morning? It's by faith. Without the deeds of the law. 
It's not Jesus and all these other externals. It's what the song the Phillips family sings. It's just Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. When's the last time you thank God He redeemed you? When's the last time you thank God He propitiated your debt? That wrath. That now we can be accepted and have access to God because of our advocate, our daysman. Let's stand. Father, we love You. We praise You. We thank You, Lord, for Your Word. We thank You for loving us, coming and dying for us. Your life for ours, the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, the not guilty for the guilty. Father, have Your will and way in this time of invitation. Get glory to Yourself is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As she plays. What about this morning? While these come,